Hi everyone, it's Jerry. In the Russian Superfinal 2011, Round 3, we had Sergei Karyakin with the white pieces paired up against Vladimir Kramnik. This was a case of white pretty much holding a slight advantage throughout the whole game, which is very typical at this high level of play. Uh, black, on the other hand, uh, just when it seemed as though uh, was going to uh, balance the game, there was an unfortunate missed opportunity prior to that uh, well, prior to meeting the time control at that move 40. Uh, so let's see how this game played out and what exactly uh, that missed opportunity was that would have certainly tipped the game in a different direction. So uh, we had e4, king pawn opening, followed by uh, Rue Lopez. And uh, not the first time Kramnik has employed this uh, Berlin defense. He's uh, well known to be employing that defense successfully. So black goes ahead, grabs that pawn, and what white will look to do is just open the position up right away at a moment where this king is uh, still uncastled. So knight d6 hits the bishop. Bishop takes knight, pawn gets captured, and the queens are off the board. So just eight moves in, a lot has just occurred. This is, uh, again, Rue Lopez, Berlin defense. What are the features? Well, uh, black has the bishop pair. Um, they're, they're uncastled. There's a fracture with regard to the pawn structure, which isn't necessarily a great liability. Uh, as an asset on the white side, we have a four on three majority with regard to the king side pawn structure. So what white, excuse me, what white will look to do is get that pawn advantage, that pawn majority rolling, and black will try to restrain it, and at the same time still. Uh, take strides in getting this king to a safe home and uh, in, in this case it comes by way of that b7 square so l let's play through a bit okay we have knight c3 and bishop to d7 so just a developing move on the white end and this particular bishop move uh, may seem a bit awkward but its purpose is to maybe just stay out of uh, the potential for a knight uh, a knight attack for, you know if it goes to e6 the knight could always play to g5 and be hitting that bishop and you know, does does Black really want to give that bish that particular bishop up? So its intention is really to just kind of half develop, uh, bring it off that back rank. Uh, it's taking steps towards getting this rook eventually involved, and it uh, it could also retreat to this e8 square to watch over f7. Uh, this does occur in the game. So uh, h3, uh, what is going on with that h3 move? Uh, it certainly has a great purpose to it. Uh, its purpose is to uh, support this g4 advance. And you, you might be thinking, well, why does that particular advance even need support? Well, it could just go there right now. But there's a serious problem with just lashing out like that right away with that g4 advance. And the drawback associated with it uh, comes in the following form. After the knight retreats to the pawn's threat, this bishop is right away hitting that g4 pawn, which is unprotected. And while you might think you could just go ahead and, let's say, support it, you'll note that after now h5, more fuel is being added to this pawn right here. A big question at this point is, can that pawn be maintained? And it, it should uh, try to be maintained on that g4 square, because if it isn't, you'll note f5 now becomes a hole in the white position. and uh, looking a bit more closer at the, the minor pieces, you'll note white does not have a light square bishop, and so maintaining pawns on light squares so that white has some control over the light squares on the chessboard is going to be of great importance. Uh, capturing is just bad for multiple reasons. This pawn hangs, this rook comes to life, f5 as a whole, etc. So really the only thing that white could do to maintain this pawn right now is play knight to h2 and the final question really to ask yourself at this point is is this knight happy on the edge of the board like that pretty much in a corner square on h2 it's not and this isn't the direction white should be going in there's no need to go about things in this manner with pressing forward with g4 right away so certainly h3 comes with a great purpose to be able to expand uh, with that g4 and after the knight moves to not have to react to a bishop threat on that g4 pawn. So after h3 we have b6 looking for that king to sneak over by way of b c8 and then b7 a4 and then a5 
a4 is looking to press forward a5 and just engage with the black pieces if this king is just super excited to just quickly get to that b7 square that's a problem because now a5 comes and what has just occurred is this pawn is now in a position where it's very flexible at any moment it could make a capture at any moment it could press forward you really don't want to allow that pawn those type of options to either close the position up or open the position up why even give that pawn that privilege stop it cold and you can do that with just a5 this type of uh, run to that b7 square can wait um, but you know you're gonna have to stop uh, white from advancing a5 right away so here we go g4 white is looking to expand their majority the knight gets kicked and you, again you'll note that there is no threat of taking on g4 just yet and so white now takes the opportunity to hit black's weak point on f7 but not only that frees up this f pawn to advance so the bishop defends by way of e8 and here we go f4 so finally this majority is rolling at this point and now we have uh, h6 kicking the knight back to f3 and this was one of the more curious type of moves for me to see I was more inclined to do a move like knight to e4 and then once I saw how white ended up deploying their pieces only then did I realize why bringing the knight back to f3 was going to be the preferred move and what it has to do with is this particular bishop did, trying to figure out you know should the knight be played to e4 f3 kinda has to do with this bishop on c1 and knowing where you would like it to be deployed so let, let's have a, a closer look at this particular bishop so we, we did have h6 now looking at this bishop for just a moment where would it like to go to what diagonal would it like to occupy if you think e3 I think it's a, a poorly placed uh, piece not only is it in a position to maybe get hit with a knight move like this but also it's just kind of staring at a rock that can't be moved and, and actually soon enough we're gonna have a move like c5 and this bishops just absolutely just shut down and so this diagonal in other words is not the greatest instead the best diagonal is gonna be the longest diagonal that a dark square bishop can be on a corner to corner diagonal and so we're gonna be seeing the bishop on b2 and you'll note that once it's on b2 this knight is not gonna to wanna to be hanging around on c3 for much longer it's gonna to wanna to allow it's going to want to allow that bishop to have a clear a much clearer view of the chessboard so this knight on the c3 square is the one who's going to want to occupy that e4 square as a result and so um, just following that type of logic this knight is going to be the one that makes use of f3 and this knight is going to want to be positioned on e4 to allow the eventual bishop bishop's placement on b2 to have a clear a clear view along that diagonal so knight f3 g6 that bishop's just getting ready to make use of that square and so we have the the black king running over to b7 getting ready to allow that rook activity bishop gets on the diagonal similarly with black and now knight to e4 so this is the the nice little harmonious uh, regrouping of the white pieces uh, a strong knight on e4 this bishop has clear sight much more clear sight opposed to having a knight still on that c3 square and uh, black is uh, ready to just uh, eventually go to b7 again and now okay so this c5 move what is going on with c5 well it allows this bishop to see that a4 pawn and it's protected but there's there are, there are some points to this uh, c5 move potential for even c4 in some instances so it's just allowing the bishop to maybe uh, come to that c6 square maybe even the knight wants to make use of that square uh, a very very purposeful move is that c5 advance so knight to g6 is looking to press forward with f5 to advance that majority and black stops that with uh, tactical uh, a tactical move here rook g8 is preventing this advance uh, because it is opposite the king and even though there are a whole bunch of pieces and pawns still in 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 the way uh, th this is how something can really backfire on white we could have just knight takes pawn in this situation after knight takes uh, bishop takes check uh, discover check on the king and then this bishop is going to be picked off 
So that's why we, we're not going to be having white advancing this pawn right here. This rook move actually prevents that advance. So instead of the pawn push, we, what we do have is just the king getting off of that same file. And now bishop d7, since that was now a threat, now this bishop finds itself in a position to watch over f5. And now here, uh, a very logical looking move is to be like, well, let's occupy this file right here with the rook because uh, it's an open file. And so you might think, well, this rook is doing something maybe, let's get this rook doing something. But I think this is just a poor move because of how black can respond. c4 is a strong reply. You'll know again, uh, that bishop is putting pressure on a4, so capturing like this is just bad for a ton of reasons. Very uh, poor pawn structure as a result, and uh, black is uh, getting rid of one of their doubled pawns and also just regaining the a pawn, and and by doing so would have a, a passed a pawn. So it's just bad on all levels. It's important not to just uh, play logical moves right away, but also take into account this particular c4 advance. So white puts that to, uh, uh, you know, white rules that particular advance out right away with just playing c4. And after king b7, we have the rook only then making use of this open file. Uh, black doing similar with their rook. White's looking to double. We have a pair of rooks that come off followed by this rook advance. It only came to g8 to prevent this f5 advance. It's no longer needed on g8, so it's time to reposition. So rook e8, knight to e4, looking to maybe pivot on that f6 square at some point. And now we have knight c6, putting pressure on this pawn, allowing the rook to see a bit more clearly. King improvement, king g3, king b8. This kind of um, seems as though it's a, a waiting move. It's kind of saying to white, you know, okay, what exactly do you have here? You know, it, it seems like black has just defended very successfully. Uh, maybe maybe the other idea is to uh, somehow have that bishop on this diagonal, but I think it's serving a, a, a perfect role on that c8 square to restrain uh, these white pawns from advancing. So king b8, and now we have bishop c3, keeping a close eye on b4, kind of negating the advancing squares that this white, or, or excuse me, that black knight can have. So rook 2, d8, the other pair of rooks come off, and now this really interesting pawn advance, and it's a pawn sacrifice, uh, e6. You know, there's no time to just go ahead and grab that bishop. We don't just recapture, we actually go for a queen. e7 hits the knight and just threatens to queen. Uh, that's going to be winning on the spot. So we don't have bishop takes bishop, but instead knight takes pawn, conveniently uh, watching over that bishop. The bishops are off, and as a result of that sequence of moves, uh, white's down a pawn. But they have a better king position, and they have knights, which are very, very tricky pieces. Um, from here, we have knight to e5, so certainly there's a lot of pressure being placed on on those black pawns. The king, the white king is here to watch over these pawns, and this, this black king is just out of play for right now. So how to really deal with the threat against f7? Uh, black ops to just advance with f5 hitting both the knight and g-pawn right here. So knight f6 gets out of that and now g5 followed by uh, this knight c6 move. So we actually have a, a, a repetition of, well a, a few moves are re repeating here because we are approaching uh, move four, 40. This last move right here knight d7 being move 37 for white. But after this king eight, king to b8 move right now, uh, white does not go for some, some draw type of thing, but instead captures on g5. And after the recapture, knight to h7. So that knight h7 move is move 39. And this move right here, this next move for white, is really the one which uh, tip, tips the game. And I think that there's a, a really interesting sequence of moves that black could have made from this position uh, if you'd like to go ahead and pause the video see what you would do in this position as black okay the move that Kramnik ended up playing was c6 and this is uh, going in the wrong direction there was a really really interesting uh, 
continuation from here and it starts with first capturing on g4 and after white recaptures this really stunning move knight to f5 and it's it's giving check to the king it's a very forcing move if the knight is not captured it's making way to d4 and once there these pawns will start falling very quickly and so after knight f5 pawn takes knight bishop takes pawn look at this bishop all of a sudden coming to life hitting this knight getting ready to pivot on c2 and go into pac-man mode grabbing these guys and you'll note that these knights are not the greatest uh, pieces right now both are finding themselves on the edge of the board not ideally placed to deal with a bishop that's going to be very fast to grab these pawns so i think a, a certainly a missed opportunity at this point for kramnik unfortunately prior to that move 40 um, but what we did have instead was c6 and now the game is uh, certainly going in white's favor from this point on so knight takes on g5 the king is getting involved and now we have black just trying to create some sort of pass pawn white will do best to just not capture uh, this pawn in either direction uh, in, in doing so and just being patient like that uh, black will not be able to create a pass pawn with just the pawns alone so king, king improvement pawns capture and now the uh, pair of knights come off and we just have a one ending for white so let's just see how the the technical phase comes into play here so more king improvement this pawn is passed it needs to be pushed capture on the the a square and now or excuse me the a4 square and now king to e7 and it seems like that's just dropping these two pawns and that's exactly what occurs in this game there is tension on this point uh, the bishop is putting pressure on it the knight is defending but this knight can capture on this square and then this square and w once it's on a5 it's then defending c4 yet again uh, but really what more is there to do besides this king move to e7 this bishop needs to keep a close eye on this pawn's advancement and if it's to let's say just pointing out one quick variation if it goes back to g8 you'll note that f5 is now available to the white king and so more progress can be made on the white side um, but that does not occur in this game instead what we do have is the king to e7 move black is uh pretty much hoping that there's going to be some draw at this point otherwise it would just be a, a slow grind in another variation so knight takes pawn knight takes another pawn and king c7 king e5 reposition with tempo bishop backs up the knight is hitting c5 we have the c pawns coming off king b6 hitting the knight bishop back knight to c3 just to watch over this pawn temporarily so bishop to c2 restraining this guy king f6 to uh, support that advance so there goes g6 and in the event of just you know is is this going to be a one game still for white well yes it is because these these are kind of acting like uh connected pawns you know if this knight is ever captured then this pawn is going to be very fast so this is certainly going to be a, a one position like that. So after g6, king b4, white doesn't have to react to that just yet. This threat is much stronger to queen. After bishop b3, only now does white react to the threat against the knight. And, well, you know what, actually, even if, even if that knight is captured, this would still be a one position. The bishop is not in a position to prevent both pawns from queening. But the knight just reacts to the threat. There is no king takes pawn here. This would finish up very quickly. A knight fork, bishop is lost, and then the pawn queens. But as this game finishes up, we do have knight e4, bishop to g8, and after king to e7, black resigns, and for good reason. If for, let, if for example, let's say king takes pawn, we would just have uh, the king going to f8. If the bishop goes to h7, knight f6 chases the bishop away from defending g8. And the other variation of the bishop, let's say, maintaining itself on this diagonal, uh, the knight can pivot by way of d6 and g5, with its next square being f7 to prevent uh, the bishop from giving itself up for the pawn. So, uh, as it was in this game, after just uh, king to e7 in this position, uh, black ends up resigning. So, uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care.